get underway here with a word of prayer. You can join me as we get settled in here. Father God, we pause and we put our eyes and our hearts upon you, God, because this word comes from heaven. We know, as the scripture says about itself, that no word of God came from any man, but your spirit filled and indwelled holy men of old who uh, wrote these words as the spirit gave them utterance. And God, it is as it claims to be the word of God sent from heaven to save us, to change us, to give us your power, to reveal your love to make us able to be who you've called us to be. So help that to happen again as we sit yielded before the words of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How many of you like to play the game of chess? Let me see. How many of you? Oh, we have quite a few brainiacs among us. (laughs) We're in for an exciting match of the game of chess of the spiritual kind here between the devious religious leaders and the Son of God, one of the oldest and most popular games in the world, chess. You know how it goes. Two players uh, declare war. Two kingdoms begin a fight to the death. The goal is to put uh, the most important piece, the king, in check, as it's called. And if you back the king into a corner and he has nowhere else to go, uh, it's checkmate. You win, the king is toppled, and his kingdom with him. Precisely what the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious bad guys in the story, are hoping for. Here in Matthew chapter 22, as they square off in the temple courts, packed and filled with worshipers from all over, tens of thousands of people, um, they are going to witness a ferocious battle of wits, a struggle a power struggle uh, between the Pharisees' little silly kingdom of men and the king who rules the world. Now, this most recent round of conflict uh, began on Passion Week and Palm Sunday when the king made his first move uh, by descending the Mount of Olives, riding on a donkey in fulfillment of a messianic prophecy that the king would ride into Jerusalem gentle and humble in heart and on a donkey, the cult of a donkey. And so this has happened. He's come into town here, and people have gathered. It's Passion Week, be named so because of the passion that Jesus had in his heart to determination to go and lay himself down on that cross. That's the week before that Good Friday is called Passion Week, and it's a Passover holiday, and that's why everybody's there. And this year, uh, the worshipers are in for an added bonus because they're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ who's been doing miracle after miracle for three and a half years. Uh, he is present this Passover in the temple courts. So they get ringside seats, as it were, to this important and fascinating and insightful conflict of all time. And uh, we, we get to see it as well. And so it's Tuesday Now, on Friday morning, he will lay down, lay himself down in love, on purpose, to bear the sins of the world. But it's Tuesday, so we're just a few days out. And uh, it's the bad guy's turn to make a move. And so Team Satan, as I like to call them, uh, initiates a public debate. Here in the temple courts, they're attempting to trap the Lord with trick questions, to put the king in check, right, and uh, get Jesus in trouble with either the patriotic uh, Jewish religious crowds or with their Roman occupiers who have a soldier every 50 feet listening. And so, but they're in for a surprise because it's impossible to outwit the one through whom all things are made. Amen? Amen. Matthew 22, starting at verse 15. This is round one of three. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. 
They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. I'll explain who they are. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Yes or no? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, you mask wearers in the Greek. Why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin, the denarius, was $150 in our money. It was one coin, and that was the tax. Show me the coin. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose portrait is this? Whose picture? Whose inscription? Caesar's. They replied. Then he said, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. They put the king in check, and he turned around and put them in check. Love it. Got to love it. So we'll go back and walk through this. Lord willing, this is pretty meaty, these two paragraphs, but I want to get to all three rounds. And it just after, because at the end, there's this delicious slam dunk by the Lord. He just goes down the court and slams dunks. Just a really, really uh, beautiful ending. We all love to see when the Lord outwits and outsmarts his opponents and wins. Because when the Lord wins, we win. Because it's a shared victory. And so, yeah. Let's talk about this first uh, theological, political hot potato, this little hand grenade, a live one. They pull the pin and toss it to Jesus and say, "Um, we've got a question for you. Catch. Hope you don't blow yourself up, you know, but no problem because Jesus is able to catch it, reconfigure it, and toss it back. Poor guys, don't they know what the Proverbs say? It is impossible to thwart the plans of God. There's no counsel or wisdom or plan that can prevail against him. And uh, people are going to learn that the hard way or the easy way. And so round one of three here, they want to wreck him with words. They want to get him in trouble. Spoiler alert. Uh, they they lose, <laughs> as I've just been saying. So, you know, if you're the kind of person who likes to eat dessert first, why don't I give you the takeaway right here from the jump, okay? There are some dessert eaters in the front row, <laughs> just so you know, right here. Uh, here's here's what, how, how King David, and through the Holy Spirit, sums up this entire deal. To the pure, you show yourself pure. To the crooked, you show yourself shrewd. Psalm 18, verse 26. And as we've noted this before, because this comes up a lot, uh, here's what the Lord is saying. Shoot straight with me, and I will shoot straight with you. Play games with me, and I'll beat you at your own game. Every single time. So... One thing these Pharisees are not doing is shooting straight. Uh, Luke's account of this exchange calls them spies sent forth on an espionage mission. So they come with flattery and a dagger in hand to trip up the son of the Most High. And uh, like that's going to happen. But I must say, it is a beautiful thing to watch our Jesus expose them and give them a verbal whooping and send them away uh, disgraced and humiliated with a sound defeat. Just We just got to love it. So now let's get reintrodu- reintroduced to the players here. So on one side of the table, the sinister Pharisees. The Pharisees were the Bible scholars, but they were corrupt. So they knew the Bible, but they didn't combine it personally with faith. And so they were religious experts without a relationship with God. So Jesus called them pretty coffins, that they looked nice on the outside. And next chapter, he will say those words and say, but inside you guys, you look good on the outside with your long robes and your pious platitudes. 
meaning, oh, praise the Lord. That's a pious platitude and all of that. But inside, he says, you crack open the casket, whoo, nothing but death and rot. So Jesus came because we all have that problem. He came to cleanse us from within, to put his spirit within. That's what makes you saved because caskets can't be good. They can only be dead. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, those dead bones can rise. And that's the point here. But it, it's something that they don't want anything to do with. They're corrupt to the bone, self-absorbed phonies. They're the prototypes of every religious swindler uh, to ever plague the generations. And so, yeah. So on the other side of the tale, the Herodians. The Herodians are... The Sanhedrin is like a parliament of the Supreme Court, a caucus. And inside the caucus are different factions. Like in our Senate, you have Republicans and Independents and, and what's the other one? <laughs> I actually blanked, but it, it played into this quite nicely. <laughs> and so... Uh, Normally, the Herodians was the group, the loyalists to the Herod dynasty, and that ought to tell you how wicked the Her Herodians are. Normally, as in all of these caucuses with different factions, there's hostility and enmity between the groups. But in this case, their hate for each other is less than their common hatred of Jesus. And so they bury the hatchet together for their common greater enemy and the greater good. Let's destroy our Messiah. <laughs> and so that's what they're doing here is crazy. And Jesus on the other side of the table, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3. God come down in human form, Colossians 2, 9. Fullness of God in a human body. Done. <laughs> At the table, the Last Supper, Philip is getting anxious. He says, you just mentioned the Father God, Yahweh. Could you give us a glimpse here on this night? We really could use a glimpse of God the Father. And he says, Philip, man, have I been with you so long and still you don't recognize me? Later, he will say, earlier from the, the Last Supper, he will say, I and the Father are one. And it's God in bodily form that these men of depraved minds are trying to outwit. Good luck with that. Notice their cowardice that they send in their understudies. They send in their disciples, younger guys who aren't as firm on their feet because, you know, that's what uh, cowardly people do. One writer said, people who lack moral character are generally not very brave people. And so that is so true. Uh, King David in Psalm 11 writes this of wicked people. For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. Psalm 11 in verse 1 there. Yeah, so these faint hearts, as our British friends say, faint-hearted people, they send an anonymous notes and they like to wreak havoc, but from behind the scenes. So who cares about these disciples of ours? If they get wrecked by Jesus, who cares? That's on them. So they stir, stir them up and send them out on a mission to trip them up, and they make sure, you say, these exact words begin with flattery. Nice words about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus knew their hearts, especially using flattery, and he called them out. In Matthew 15, earlier, he's already called them out uh, with this quote from Isaiah chapter 29. He says, you guys, you guys are people who draw near to me with your mouth and honor me with your lips but your heart is far from me, you see. So nice words about Jesus here. Check them out. Four nice things they say. You know, if only they believed him. They don't believe him. They're using all four. They're not random. 
They are not just picking things nice to say. They're picking things to set a trap for him because that's what Proverbs says. Proverbs 29 says, he who flatters someone lays a trap for their feet. And those aren't just four random accolades. They are set up to trip him up, and I'll show you that in a second. So as the Proverbs also says, an enemy multiplies kisses. That's what they do, right? That's what Judas did. So here comes four smooches, Judas style. You know, teacher, four things everyone knows about you, sir. Now follow the logic. Number one, uh, in the Greek it says, you are true. It's kind of awkward because we don't really call somebody true. Or we would say something, you have integrity. Number two, you teach God's word truthfully and faithfully. No turning to the right or no turning to the left for you. You straight arrow you. Number three, you're fearless. You're courageous. Number four, you're no respecter of person. Therefore, don't miss this. Since we can depend on you to speak the truth, even if it gets you in serious trouble with the Jewish authorities or with our mighty Roman occupiers, we can count on you to just say the word that will upset either side. Because that's exactly, there's no win here. There's no win possible. Unless if the answer is yes or no, Or is it yes and yes? Whoa, they didn't see that one coming. So Jesus has a way to disarm it. Some quick, helpful background so you can understand why this is such a political hot potato. The Jews were not free people. uh, And they haven't been until 1948. This is a shout out to God's promise that said, though I scatter you all over the place and you not be a nation, but I will gather you back and you will become a nation in a day. Isaiah. And boom, in May, in 1948, surprise, prophecy comes to pass after 2,500 years of not being a nation, but they come into their own, but they're not a nation now. Who's ruling them? Rome, and as Rome's miserable subjects, they hated the pagans and the the Gentile rule. They were ordered by that government to pay taxes to a Gentile Caesar they hated. As if I need to say this part, the the distaste for governments and obligatory taxes has long been an issue uh, all over the world. No no amen needed there, by the way. So um, Ben Franklin is the one who said, there are two things you can count on in life, death and taxes, right? But Ben left out this one thought. (laughs) Seems some would prefer death rather than handing over hard-earned money to those they deem as evil, oppressive, and inept, like many in the audience did that day. So they toss Jesus this uh, loaded question. Uh, Now, Barclay, commentator, uh, uh, he says there were uh, three kinds of taxes. Uh, Number one, the ground tax. So it was to tax the goods you produced. So 10% on any grain production and 20% on any olive oil or wine that you produce Uh, In short, it's a business tax. Uh, You're taxed on your goods. Uh, Income tax, get this, 1% of a man's income. (laughs) Such a deal. (laughs) And number three was the poll tax. This was the most hated and most despised, and this is uh, the tax in question. It was called the just because tax uh, because money went from your wallet into Caesar's bank account for the sole privilege of being governed by such a wonderful man as Caesar. Now, it wasn't the 150 bucks that really irked them so much, as much as what the tax signified. The pious Jews were known to call this tax the most obvious, visible way we show our submission to the godless state of the Roman Empire. 
So, and, and here's the problem. Here's a slide of the denarius in question. This was $150 front and back of the coin engraved a graven image of Caesar Augustus, who was the father of the Roman Empire. And so it says so to the divine son of Caesar Augustus, Lord. He is the god of Rome. And on the back it says he is the the most high priest, the mediator between God and man. If you want to know God, you've got to, to worship him. And here's the sting. They had to take their shekels and trade it in for this coin that they saw violated commandment number one and commandment number two. No other gods before me, saith the Lord, and no graven images. And there you have it all summed up in one little coin that they had to trade out their Hebrew money and feel like they're selling out God and taking this terrible, blasphemous coin and putting it in their own hand and paying it as a part of what they earned, their own substance. So it was a really, really deep and profoundly felt of and they felt violated and demeaned and all of this. And so this is what's going on there. And so, yeah, the, 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 the first two commandments violated like that. So what to do? If Jesus says, yes, support your pagan overlords, he's offending their sensibilities. He could say yes, but he needs wiggle room to talk about it. There are some questions that are so complicated, a yes and no, you cannot do it without getting tripped up. And so he doesn't want to uh, offend uh, his Jewish uh, friends here that he came uh, to save. It's a, he would seem unsympathetic and uh, to their moral struggle and conflict. And like he's endorsing occupation and idolatry, it's just uh, not the way to go. But if he says no, go ahead and evade the tax, the pagan tax, uh, the Romans would move in. And for treason, not to mention, it will go against what God will ultimately say is our obligation. So what to do? So tell us, good and courageous teacher, who always says the right thing, no matter what, even if you're going to get in trouble for it, we know you're going to say it. Should we or shouldn't we pay taxes? So Jesus, first of all, his response, love it. Next slide we can see. Um, he says, first of all, you're hypocrites. Let, let the whole crowd know that you're wearing a mask. You, you come at me with flattering words, and yet you want to destroy me. And then I like how he outs their treachery. Uh, he doesn't say, look, I know what you're doing. You're trying to trap me. He doesn't say that, does he? Why does he pose it as a question to them? Because he wants those men to reflect. Why would you? Why would you want to trap somebody like me? Think about it. Something is really wrong. You have seen me for three and a half years. When have I ever done anything to make you want to, in evil, trap me and hurt me and resist me and reject me? You've seen three and a half years of of selflessness of miracle after miracle after miracle, hundreds of miracles, and they've seen them. After he came and kicked everybody out of the temple, he healed the blind and the lame for hours. The scriptures say, in the temple courts, blind people and lame people dancing around and blind people seeing so I'm asking you a question. What is possessing you from resisting a God who loves you, a God who evidences himself through miracles and powers and signs and wonders? What is your problem? You better think about this and fix it before you die in that condition. That's why he phrases it that way, right? 
And so uh, Jesus makes his move. <laughs> he gets his hand on their, you know, pawns or whatever. <laughs> Show me a coin, he says there. And now, those hypocrites would say, never, ever bring in a Roman coin that looked like that into the temple, the holy area of God. Now, it would be very inconvenient not to have those coins on you as you go in and out because you need those coins to buy stuff outside of the temple. But they would preach you're a sinner if you had those coins on you in the temple. So Jesus says, <laughs> he says, so who's got a coin? Because he didn't. But they do. The ones you teach, oh, you sinner, having godless pagan money on you. No, they fall for the trap. They forget, oh, well, I got one here. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and they pull it out, and everyone goes, oh, 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 yeah, yeah. We see how it works. It's like everybody has to wear a mask. Everybody, yeah. except moi. <laughs> Sorry. I threw that in for free. The first service didn't get it. The, <laughs> the third service is not going to get it. <laughs> but, uh, but you, my friends. Now, so what, yeah, so he's saying, I got a question for you. He says, whose image is that? Who stamped the image on that? Right? Whoever stamps their image on something that must belong to him? It's Caesar's. Well, give Caesar what seems to be Caesar's. There you go. But don't forget your most profound obligation of all, whose image is stamped on your soul. In whose image were you made and fashioned in your mother's womb? It was the image of the Most High God into you. Now render back to God everything that belongs to God, and it will make civil obedience a lot sweeter, easier, and more joyful. And it will give, when you give everything to God and you live by his word, it will define civil um, obligations. It will limit them. We will know by God's word that when the Pharaoh tells the midwives, hey, look, I'm getting a little antsy about all these Hebrew boy babies. So when you're helping them give birth, kill it if it's a boy. And the midwife said, no. They didn't say that to his face, but they disobeyed. Why? Because God wanted them to. And when they said, we told you a million times, you apostles, to shut up. Stop talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Don't say his name ever again. Acts chapter 4. Well, sorry. Normally, we obey our authorities. But you can't contradict something that God tells us to do. So judge for yourself, gentlemen, if it's OK by God to listen to you or to listen to him. But Jesus, our Lord, wants all his people to know you may have an out here, and you may have an out there, but you don't have an out when it comes to taxes. That's what he's saying. Now, one person says, sorry, I heard a groan. <laughs> uh, my condolences to you, sir. <laughs> yeah, I love this point here. First the scripture and then the comment on the scripture, and I think you'll like it, and then we'll move on. The scripture, Romans 6, verse 13, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of right living. Now, the comment, the comment. It's only as we do this, living in full, total obedience to God and seeking his kingdom first that we can be good citizens on earth his love inspiring us, his grace sustaining us, and his peace guarding our hearts until this temporary and flawed human system of governance gives way to the eternal rule and reign of the benevolent king. And of his rule and of his peace, there shall be no end. So when Jesus says pay back, he's using a different verb. They say, should we give our money? And he says, no, you should pay back. 
In other words, government is God's idea all over the earth and wherever you are. If you're a human on the planet today, you have a Caesar to deal with. The only one who has no Caesar is someone in hell. Every place else, including heaven, is structured with a hierarchical uh, form of authority and submission everywhere. And so God's idea, good or bad, and just let me say this, the one on the throne at the time Jesus is speaking is a thousand times worse than any of the worst U.S. presidents. Those Caesars were wicked. So that, my friend, is Romans 8.28. God using their evil intent to trip up the Lord and God saying, thank you very much. I wanted to address this with my people so that they could see how to live a sacred holy life in a secular fallen world and please God and balance it. As um, Peter put it, fear God and honor the king. There it is. By the way, that's First Peter uh, chapter 2. Okay, round two. The Pharisees scatter, or their disciples. They're like, oh, sorry, boss. That same day, the Sadducees, the other faction, who say there's no resurrection, or angels, or heaven, or supernatural. You die, you die. They're unbelievers. They're liberal theologians. We'll talk about them. They came with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us in Deuteronomy 25 that if a man dies without having children, mostly sons, his brother must marry the widow for the sake of the widow to protect the widow and carry the family name and have children for him. Now, we've got a story. Oy vey. It's hard to believe, but it's true. There were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, no kids. And since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second, and then the third. Oy vey, Jesus, right down to the seventh. Oh my goodness, finally the woman died too. Now then, at your so-called fairy tale, pie in the sky, resurrection, heaven, where they're all fighting now, because they all had her as their wives, whose husband, whose wife will she be of the seven, since they all uh, were married to her. And Jesus says... <laughs> You are mixed up and in error for two reasons. One, you don't know your Bible. And number two, you haven't experienced the power of God. At the resurrection, people, are it's different. They, they're, they're, they're not in couples and families and having children. Things have changed. We relate to each other differently. They're not given in marriage. They'll be like angels. They don't become angels. Please, please get that, you know. They're like angels who don't get married off in couples and raise children. But about the resurrection, P.S., since you're having trouble believing that you will rise from the dead and that there's a heaven, have you not read what God said to you in Exodus chapter 3? I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, gentlemen, but of the living when the crowds heard this, they were astonished. The word means to be knocked out of yourself. I love that. To be, we say that, to be beside yourself, right? So let's talk about this. We move from a political hot potato to a theological quandary, a ridiculous, silly question. So the Sadducees uh, don't believe in a heaven, right, or an afterlife. And that's why they're sad, you see. The Pharisees were called the lawyers in the sense of a PhD theologian. So they would tell you what was, biblically speaking, fair. So they were fair, you see. <laughs> it's not that I don't try. I try. So here's something ridiculous here. These, li these are the liberal theologians, the father 
of those who have religious advanced degrees and religious studies from Yale and Princeton who make their appearance on uh, NPR radio at Christmas and at Easter in search of the real Jesus. Let's try to look for the real Jesus everywhere except the Bible. I would just say, can we open the Bible to find the real Jesus? Because I think he's in there. You know, oh my goodness. Anyway, don't get me started. These are, these are them. Only the fathers, the prototypes. And so life after death, here, here's something to know. And they said they believed only in the first five books. It's called the Torah, right? That's what they believed in. They didn't buy anything else. It was all about the first five books, right? And so the first five books have plenty of allusions to uh, angels, which they said didn't exist. Plenty. A dozen off the top of my head. And also allusions to the abode of God, the heaven, the place where God dwells. And so they're out of their minds. And so Jesus said, you got... Uh, t- uh, well, let's let's back up and go to the the ridiculous story. So they remind him of leveret marriage. It was called for the verb in Hebrew lavi, which is means brother-in-law. Okay, and so to protect the widow, as I said, and to continue the family name, this was the way things were done. And so they make up this story, and and they they couch it in terms like, oh, we know them. They're among us right here. He's, I'm looking at a guy, right? Yeah, right. So, so they're lying, lying as usual. Seven brothers, one dies without kids. Number two goes to marry her. He dies. Number three, number four, number five. And none of them, they all die right after the honeymoon. I, and, there's, <laughs> and, and one guy surely in the crowd is saying, wait a second here. I think I saw this on Dateline once. <laughs> I think there's something wrong with the wife. Now, you know, because I could hear one of the brothers, like around five, six, or seven, say, Dad, 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 no, Dad, I want to move overseas. I I see a pattern, Dad, but this is not good, Dad. You know, so, yeah. No, I imagine Jesus was doing everything with divine power to not, just keel over, busting up, <laughs> laughing, and just saying, you guys are really ridiculous. So we'll forward the slide. And he says, number one, you go astray. It means you're adrift you, and, and, with a sense of danger. You're on the Niagara. You've got no engine. You're drifting to the false. And when you're not anchored to God's truth and you don't know the Bible is exactly, you're drifting. It's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time before you go careening down to your own peril. And so he says, number one, you don't know your Bible. Because if you did know your Bible, then you'd remember, oh, the angels came to Lot. Do you remember angels there? You say, that's in the first five books, sir. You know, how about, how, how about angels appearing to Abraham in Genesis? How about the angels on the ladder? A ladder going to where, gentlemen? the ladder to heaven with angels ascending and descending. That's all in the books that you claim. It's possible to know the Bible and not believe in the Bible. And that's where these guys, just terrible, you know. And then number two, not only don't you know the scriptures, but you don't know the power of God. So since you haven't experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in your own heart, uh, you've never experienced his power to transform you. You've never been wowed by a miraculous answer to prayer. I don't know about you. I've been in this 42 years. I've seen some mighty powerful answers to prayer where I'm astounded, just astounded. Not all the time, but I will just go, whoa, whoa, goosebumps, oh, good, right? Right. So the idea for somebody who's been personally touched and healed and warmed by the other presence of God himself. Oh, it's not difficult to imagine him doing anything because you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good and powerful. 
you see, but they hadn't. So he just points it out. You don't know the scriptures or you would see evidence of a heaven and angels and the supernatural and life after death. And you don't know the power of God in your own heart. That's what he says. And if you haven't in your own heart been raised to new life, Jesus is telling them, then it's hard to imagine the resurrection to come. But us, the Holy Spirit has already raised us to a new life. We aren't who we used to be. We're not all we will will become, but we're going to get there. So here's your problem. And, uh, you know, it comes as, and here's the truth now, he says, in in, in, in heaven, we don't relate to each other as husband and wife and having babies and all of that. He said there's a different order of things. Now, that's either good news or bad news, depending on the condition of your marriage. (laughs) I found that funny. I don't know. Um, Now, you know what? Listen, when we get there, there's going to be a a lot of new stuff, just a lot of new. Uh, John says uh, what we're going to be like and who we're going to be. Who we're going to be is us, perfected. But it's all like a foggy uh, window looking through. He goes, but we do know one thing. When we see him, we will be like him. For We shall see him as he is. But, you know, we're not going to be continuing this kind of life there. We're not going to be driving cars and playing golf and getting married and all of that stuff. Sorry about the golf. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but who knows? I just want to say this. Whatever, whatever joys are in this life, they're foreshadows of a greater joy. So name the joy, the holy joy, because we're so warped, we find joy in doing the wrong thing, which is crazy. So what I mean is the holy joys, the good joys. Find that holy joy and just ramp it up about a thousand times because heaven will not disappoint. So if you're just confused about, well, you know, my personal opinion is is that if you became one with somebody, you have a special relationship with them. You, We know each other. We are who we are there. We retain our personhood. I personally think I'm just saying that there's a special relationship with somebody you became one with. But it's just saying you won't be in couples and married families and procreating unless you're a Mormon. (laughs) Oh, you didn't know that. Oh, 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 they don't lead with that when they knock on your door? They don't say, oh, oh, we're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who populate planets and procreate them with our eternal wives, and if you were married here, you're married in the temple, and you go to heaven married, and you procreate your own planet. What? We didn't mention that? Sorry. (laughs) All right. Do you get it? Can we move on? I think there's a part here. So here's what he's saying. And P.S. P.S. Because he loves them, and he wants them to come to heaven, believe it or not, after they repent. He says, look, gentlemen, in Exodus 3, the Bible you say you believe in, the book, Exodus, uh, God identifies himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Guess what? At the time Jesus is speaking, they were dead, right? Or at the time, at the time, at the time Moses heard God say that, they had been dead for 1,500 years. So if, gentlemen, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob just became peat moss and they don't exist, they are into the ground and they're, they're not there, why would God say 1,500 years after their death, I am his God? Because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive and well and he is their God and they are his living people. That's his point to them. And that's what knocked them. Like, whoa, didn't think about that. Yeah, should have before you came calling. Okay, this, <laughs> this third round is quick. Moves fast. Here we go. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees now done with their failure uh, disciples, 
bring in the expert Pharisees. Well, we'll show them we're no novices. So they bring an expert with the white beard, <laughs> tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Of the 613, we want you to elevate one and disrespect all the others. There's no win here. There's no win. And, and it will confuse him. There's no answer to this. We, I've been having this question all my life, and Jesus just snaps right back. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with everything in your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and I'll throw in the second for free. Love yourself. And here's a little bit of a slam. The way you love yourself. That doesn't mean you have to love yourself before you love somebody. He's saying that same focus of me first, and the passion you have to be all about you, apply that to the other, and you'll be good. So now why does he say that? He says, I'm not going to elevate one over all the others. I'm going to tell you the two from which all the others spring. Because if you do the first one, you love God with everything you got, you don't need thou shalt anything. You don't need thou shalt not because you're not going to put any God before him because you love him with everything you got. You, you're not going to have a graven image of some lesser God, some idolatrous, adulterous spirit because you love God. And you're going to take some time to worship with God's people. Why? Because you love God and you love the things God loves, his children. Well, you don't need a law if you love God. And he's also showing them, you want to know what the most important law is? Not being a religious keeper of do's and don'ts. It's about loving God and God loving you. The do's and don'ts come out of a living, breathing relationship with the God who made us. So... Now, if you love others with that kind of love, you don't need any other that, that thou shalt not send, thou shalt none. Because if you love them, you're not going to be envious of them or jealous because you love them, right? You won't hold grudges because you love them. You won't tear people down because you love them. You won't gossip. You won't be lazy. You know why? Laziness is a breach of love because you burn in others with the tasks you should be doing. So it all comes down to, if you love others, you don't need any laws. You won't be sexually immoral and take advantage of somebody God loves who you supposedly love and put them spiritually in harm's way so you can be gratified wanting what a husband deserves, not a boyfriend Oh, no, no, no. You won't do that because you love her. You really love her more than you love yourself. You see. So Jesus says two commandments. You can check the whole Old Testament off. Check, done. (laughs) Just do those two things. And then, of course, we can't do them very well. And that's where he said he would say, and then come to me because you guys are going to fall short, but I'm going to die for that so that you can love me with everything you've got. Now, while they're astounded, he says, oh, don't go anywhere. i got a question for you guys. And here comes the slam dunk. Oh, my goodness. Love it. And with this, we finish up. While the Pharisees were gathered still there and they haven't scattered, you know when you turn over a log and there's some bugs that see the light and they they just go running for cover? Uh, Before they could do that, Jesus says to them, what do you, I want to talk about Messiah. Christ is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Messiah, Messiah. It means the selected one, the Savior. I want to talk about the the Christ now. They all know that he's claiming to be Christ. He just came in on a parade and everybody's waving branches saying, Christ, Christ, Christ. And he received it. So he says, I want to talk about the...
Christ. <laughs> Whose son is he? Who's he related to again in the Bible? We have a genealogy. He's like born of a human, and he's related to humans. I just want to refresh my memory. Who is he? They say he's related to David. He's the son, but he's actually the great-grandson times 42, times 42 greats. But write the bloodline from King David all the way to Mary. Mary's related to King David by blood and Jesus to King David through Mary. But Jesus says, you know, I've got a problem. Psalm 110, verse 1, has always been a problem, and I hope you guys can solve it. Because here you have King David by the Spirit, which shows you the Psalms are the Word of God. King David, by the Spirit, in Psalm 110, verse 1, calls the Messiah God. God speaks to God. Now, now if he's a human descendant of David, how can you call him God? Just curious. <laughs> I love that. I did the Silas part on purpose. Because he's saying, here's the answer. Unless, of course, according to Isaiah chapter 7, a virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son conceived of the Holy Spirit so that the union of the Holy Spirit and a human egg brings the God-man born of a human conceived of God himself. So gentlemen, you might want to change the way you're thinking about me. Maybe I'm not some wannabe, frenzied rabbi. But maybe, according to the scriptures, I could be wonderful counselor, almighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. That's in their scriptures, saying Messiah would be called Almighty God, Everlasting Father. And then Jesus will say in John chapter 10, I and the Father are one. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your victory. It's our victory. It's a shared victory. We thank you, God, that we can trust you with our battles. Nothing's too difficult or complicated for you. You show that chapter by chapter. Oh, I hope us to enjoy that you're with us and have that bold confidence that no, nothing, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. God, that you are making a way for us and you will give us the victory. In Jesus' name, amen.